Welcome everybody to our Wild Food webinar. Really glad you could join us, whether you're watching us live now, whether you're watching us from YouTube, and a special welcome to our patrons. So welcome to you all, wherever you may be and wherever you've come from. Uh, we're really glad you joined us. Yes, there's a huge uptake in people's interest in wild food, nature, their local green spaces. People aren't traveling around and haven't been for weeks, so they're exploring their local spaces and they're looking at plants. They wanna know what it is, they wanna know what they can do with it. So in terms of us and our business, it's brilliant. You know, we, we, we're so on trend right now. <laughs> I've never been cool before. We've never been cool, but yeah, suddenly we are. And it's, a, it's amazing because people are really, really interested. And this, these webinars have just gone to show how people's interest in nature has just taken off. And, and it's wonderful. And especially, I think, with foraging as well on the idea of wild food, you know, there's been a big surge in people baking, doing sewing, doing DIY, yeah. gardening. And I think wild food and foraging goes with that as well. People getting time to practice some of these things they've always had an interest in but now they can actually say you know what I'm gonna take a bit of time to do that so uh it's great that there's all this interest so thank you to everybody for joining us we should introduce ourselves yes I'm Lee uh one half of Woodland Classroom and I'm James hello we're based in northeast Wales and uh we run uh bushcraft courses wild food mindfulness in nature forest school for kids although that's what we do usually, but of course we're on lockdown and uh, things aren't changing anytime soon for us. So we put all this stuff on online because we've missed running our wild food courses and we've had this amazing response. So it's really great that you're here. Yes. Let's tell you a little bit about how it's gonna work tonight, so you all know. We're gonna cover quite a few plants. They're all seasonal plants that are available either now or in the next coming weeks coming into their own. So it's all stuff that you can do. Most of them are common plants you can easily get hold of and identify, so it's stuff that you can do yourself we want you to come away with good ideas and you want to mention about recipes yes i'm not here to tell you you need a spoon of sugar and half a gram of butter or anything like that i'm going to give you ideas to of recipes that you can go away and google do your research but for, for me it's about us sharing ideas of what we can do with these wild plants then you go away and find the recipes because there's an abundance of information online uh, we will share some recipes in the ebook, but mainly it's about well, what can I do with this plant and just giving ideas, okay? Now, yeah. while I'm doing a webinar, I like to drink a nice cup of tea, James. Would you like a nice cup of tea? I would love a cup of tea. <laughs> so I drink my wild teas in one of these. Um, what's it called again? It's called an infuser. An infuser. <laughs> so these are, these are great, um, but you don't need to get special equipment. You can uh, boil your weeds up in a pan and use a sieve but tonight we're having elderflower and mint tea ah. so elderflower of course is good hay fever remedy um i'll talk about the medicinal properties in a little while mm. but it goes really well with mint uh last night i had it with nettle i ran out of nettle and uh that was really good but the elderflower really sweetens <clears> it up so a lot of wild teas people perhaps might turn their nose up at so we can add honey to improve the flavor or elderflower hugely improves the flavor as well because of the pollen and that sweetness mm. so i'll pour while you carry on thanks yeah there's some good sweet foods coming into their own now at this part of the season and we're going to talk about some of the tastiest ones tonight and some of the easiest ones to find should we go through a little bit of the basics, kind of how to stay safe with foraging, what you should take with you, kind of where to decide maybe not to pick. So in terms of staying safe, use your common sense with it. I mean, that's really important. I would say if you're on the side of a footpath, think about where dog might have cocked its leg, think about that height, and think if you're gonna pick, pick from a bit further back or higher up, or go further into the scrub, the woodland edge, the hedgerow, and pick from there. So have a look at what's going on. How frequently used is the footpath? Do you get a lot of dog walkers if you're in a country park or a town park? So just use your common sense with that. That's a, the first rule, I would say. The edge of agricultural yeah. land as well. That's very important. So if you're in an area that has a lot of arable farming, um, they might well spray, spray pesticides or insecticides. So that's something to be wary about on the edge of the woodlands or the edge of hedgerows as well. Think about spray coming across. So if you've seen spraying happening, that's maybe something you want to avoid and be careful of or have a conversation with the landowner and see what's going on there. 
We also recommend taking two identification books with you. In fact, we very often have three or four in our rucksack. Um, one, I see there's discrepancies between different books. One might have illustrations, one might have photographs. It's really hard to tell with just one book, but comparing two makes it a lot easier to make a positive <laughs> identification. Yeah. And when it comes to the law, we had a question on this the other night. Um, the law as it stands is that you can't uproot a wild plant without permission of the landowner. So um, make sure you've got the permission of whoever owns the land, manages the land, that you can do some foraging there if you're uprooting the plants. That's a good advice. And we went into quite a bit of detail about the law in our mm. first webinar. So if you're interested in that, do check that out. Yes, there are some old kind of common laws and things like that which apply, but do check out the other webinar if you want the breakdown of what that's all about or drop us an email. And the sides of busy roads, think about pollution. You might not want to forage there. Yeah, I mean, we don't have all the lead um, in fumes that we used to have, but uh, still, it's, if there's a choice between the busy side of the road or quiet hedgerow somewhere else, pick option number two. And it's worth mentioning now the foraging year and the different flavours we get throughout the year. Early spring and still now we're getting a lot of wild greens, bitter flavours and when out foraging we can taste a plant, mm. perhaps a dandelion leaf and think that's quite bitter, why would I bother? However, bitter flavours are excellent for the digestive system and it's what our body requires after a winter of perhaps eating the the, the, so as a hunter-gatherer, we would have been storing up our berries, our sweeter foods, perhaps dried meats and things. And in winter, our bodies are ready for a detox. And a lot of the wild greens have this, this detoxifying uh, quality to them. Not all of them are bitter, especially if you pick the right young, fresh leaves. However, our palates aren't really used to those flavours. But don't let that put you off because they are so good for you that you really need to get used to those flavours. And we certainly feel like we're used to them. And there are ways in which you can get these excellent foods into your diet by clever recipes or mixing them with things and uh, make them much more palatable for our, our tastes. Because of course our diet now is pretty unhealthy and we're used to very high sugar, fatty foods but we are also suffering with a lot of bowel problems, IBS, Crohn's disease. So think about what nature is showing us that we should be eating right now and go with it. Somebody just mentioned in the chat room um, about kind of uh, practices with foraging, good practice, and about not taking too much. So Sarah, thanks for that comment. We're going to come to that when we talk about the pig nut a bit later on, but it's a good point and we will talk about it. So let's start with our first plant we're going to go in depth with and that is, well it's a, it's a couple of plants really, it's, it's the sorrel and uh, there are three plants in the UK here which are known as sorrel but um, there are three types, there's the wood sorrel, there's the common sorrel and there's the sheep sorrel and they're all called sorrel because they all taste the same, they've got this fantastic Granny Smith apple lemony flavour which really just zings in the mouth it doesn't usually get make it all the way home for me because um, it's uh, something you just pop in your mouth and eat while you, when you're out and about. But it's beautiful stuff. But people talk about sorrel and say, oh, I found sorrel today, or what does it look like? And it can be confusing because there are three types. So let's show you some pictures of them so we can understand the types of three sorrels. This is a completely different plant to this pl the other sorrel, but it's got the same name because it's got the oxalic acid in it which gives it the flavour but it's actually unrelated plant. Tastes amazing, it's a great one for kids because straight away they can get a really pleasant taste. Good for freshening the breath. This makes a really good addition to a mayonnaise, a couscous, anything where you might use the lemon uh, as a flavouring, so chicken, fish, hummus, couscous, those are, two, those are the ones that jump into my head. It was used very much in medieval times to flavour soups. Um, yeah, pesto, it's Pesto, amazing in pesto. Um, so, yeah. And this is uh, wood sorrel, and the handy thing is it's found in the woods, so it's easy to remember the name. Uh, you're not really finding this out in meadows and grasslands so much. It likes those shadier, damper spots, and it grows very much like a carpet, like we can see on the mm. picture here. Earlier in the season, it has 
beautiful little white flowers with red pinky veins. So look out for those earlier in the spring, but now it's looking like this. And what you want from these plants is the nice, fresh, green, lush leaves. If they're looking a bit tired and past their best, they are. So always go for those. And actually with the wood sorrel, there's a long season of them. They can be picked for quite a long time. You can even find them in the winter, can't you? Yeah, pretty much throughout the year. But of um, course, they're growing at their best now. And you're getting a lot more of them. And they're nice one to pick at. You'll find them growing low in a carpet across um, hedges, rock faces, things like that. And growing quite shallow soil. Yeah. Especially with ferns and things like that, you tend it's to see a great it. one. That's the wood sorrel. Looks we've got like another one there. here. And this is the one we've actually got here in the studio with us. What you're seeing here is the tall flower spike. And we'll get to that. But here's the lower parts of the plant. This is the common sorrel. And the common sorrel has quite distinctive leaves, as we'll see. They're ovular, slightly glossy there. And when it's young like this, it has this kind of spreading, slightly bushy appearance. And you find it on more acidic soils or sort of red. So if that's what you've got, you're more likely to find it. But the best way to test that this is sorrel is to taste it. Um, and the taste is unmistakable. You're going to get that Granny Smith apple again, that lemon flavour that will zing out straight away. If you're getting no taste or a bit of bitterness, um, it's definitely not sorrel because it, sorrel is so distinctive in its taste. But have a look at the leaf here. Can you see, we've got a sample here as well, the two little wings which are pointing out at the back of the leaf there like that and where the uh, stem meets the base of the leaf there. Well, that's what really tells us it's sorrel, obviously without tasting it. That's very, very distinctive. And that's what the common sorrel has. So look out for that. That is the distinctive feature. As the plant gets older and you have this longer stem that we have here, you can see on the picture, there's a really close shot of the leaf there. And now those two wings are wrapping around the stem. Can you see at the base of the picture there? And that's really key. It's not a lot of plants that do that. It's really distinctive. So it's a good way to look for it. Again, try the tip of the leaf, have a nibble. If you get that strong taste we talked about, you've got sorrel. For all you beginners out there who are frightened of poisoning yourself, don't worry. We're forever nibbling bits of leaves and thinking, oh, that's not, that's not edible. We're fine. Um, so a little bit of a nibble here and there will probably do you no harm because if it tastes grotty, you will spit it out. Um, but you'll know straight away with a lot of plants because you, you've read in the book that it tastes like this and it's just a key indicator to make a positive identification. identification. And we're not going to cover any plants which could be really confused, anything that's really dangerous. No, no, no. So you can be safe with these. There's the flower spike that we showed you um, in the studio here. You can see that. Looks like a kind of a small dark flower. So you'll get that standing tall. And the, uh, the plant stands about so tall. You know, it's got some good height to it. It'll poke up above the grass. That's the common sorrel. Here is sheep sorrel. And sheep sorrel is not one I found yet, but look how those wings on the back of the leaf are no longer pointed, they actually stick out to the side. That's quite distinctive. And low growing. But it's, yeah, it's low growing, it's smaller than the common sorrel, and uh, not one I found yet, but again, the flavor will be the same. So if you find that, those distinctive wings there, you've got sheep sorrel, and there it is again. It is also high in vitamin C, so well worth looking out for on your explorations. Now we're going to go to one of the stars of the season. It's the elderflower. And the elderflower is one, as we've mentioned already before we started, it's in oh, abundance. So... It smells lovely, doesn't it? It smells amazing. It's really coming into its own now, the elderflower. It's starting to look really good. Um, if you're um, in southern England, a little bit more, slightly warmer areas, we're slightly higher up in northeast Wales here. It's got a couple of weeks to go, but you might see it in abundance where you are. And uh, it's good stuff. You're going to recognise the smell straight away. A few people have asked on Wednesday's webinar about identification. It is off a tree. It's not a plant. So all the cow parsley and the umbilifer family that you see growing out of the ground, it's a tree. There it is up close. We can see the elderflower there in all its glory. And it has that kind of champagne-y poppy fizz to it on a bright sunny day almost a kind of a yellowy fizz with the pollen there. And you know it's a good day for it because the insects, the pollinators are all over it. The only tree you could maybe confuse it with at this time of year is the rowan or the mountain ash as people know it, because that also has a cluster of white creamy flowers, but it doesn't have the smell. Um, so it's quite different. And the leaves are quite different as well. They're much smaller. 
These are the elder leaves you're looking at now, whereas the rowan leaves are made of a small leaflets like what you're seeing, but they are smaller and more toothed. And that's the rowan. But these are the elder, elder leaves. The elder tree itself is steeped in folklore. It is said that if you're in the presence of the tree on Midsummer's Night, you'd see the fairy king ride by. The elder tree is nicknamed the whole medicine chest in one plant. So the leaves are not edible, but you can rub them on your skin as an insect repellent. The flowers are known as an excellent fever remedy and also for, as an antihistamine. But my favourite, so I wouldn't actually chop all the flowers off because when, they, when we leave them, they turn into elderberries. Elderberries are my favourite medicine. They are super good for boosting your immune system and fighting off colds, flu. Um, and in about three months, I'll be sharing some amazing remedies and recipes with you in our other wild food webinar. Yeah, it's but, one of my favourite ones, the elderberry uh, with a bit of brandy and brandy, some mulled honey. spices. It's a real winter okay, Christmassy yeah. drink. So, uh, and it's a medicine. It's great. Yep, so it's the great whole medicine. Sort, oh, yeah. And we, we mentioned this earlier. Pick the flowers on a dry, sunny day. We've dipped them in batter and fry, deep fried them in our forest score. And I made the mistake of picking it on a wet, uh, dull day and they tasted totally different. They were ugh, a bit icky. The, the sun comes out, the pollen comes out and they taste amazing. But the difference if you pick them on a, on a wet, dank day is quite, it's really, really different. So just be aware of that. Mm, mm. <clears throat> so that's the elderflower, really, really good stuff. And it's in abundance. It's easy to pick. It's a nice, safe one. And you can make all kinds of stuff with it. So elderflower cordial, elderflower champagne, elderflower cider, uh, dipped in batter and fried. Now, it, when I've done that, I've added a little bit of elderflower cordial to the batter mix, just to give it that extra elderflower oomph. Um, it works well with mint. It's mm. a great summer drink to use. Um, and in terms of the method ooh, to harvest ooh. it, you can get a uh, fork behind the stalk bases, can't you? And then just fork them off yeah, like fork. that with a little fork. And that Because what you don't want is the stalks. The stalks got all bitterness in it. In fact, it's only the elderflowers that are edible. Um, you don't want to eat the leaves. They're not good for you at all. Um, definitely don't do that. And you don't want to have the stalks. That's going to Im um, impair the flavour. So you just want the, the polleny flowers. That's what you're after. Make sure you haven't got any bugs. Someone mentioned shaking the plant a little bit beforehand. Yeah, good idea. If you're going to shake it though, you do want to get that pollen. So shake it over the bowl you're collecting in. And any maybe over a sieve, the pollen will probably go through and then any little bugs will fall into the sieve. So that's a, a good way to do that. And because it's so good at cutting congestion and inflammations of the upper respiratory tract, I've made my own medicine. And again, like the tea, this is a remedy for hay fever and upper respiratory tracts. So this is nettle and elderflower, same ingredients, but with raw honey. I always use lo raw local honey, but you either dry the stuff, you put it in honey, there are ways of preserving it so you've got stuff all year round to help you, um, but that's dead easy. That just needs to sit in more honey for about six weeks. I did add, add a little bit of brandy to that as well because the honey was quite, it wasn't runny enough, so I'd, you can always add a little bit of brandy or vinegar to water it down. Well, that's enough of uh, the elderflowers for now. What we're going to do, we're going to come to our first guest of the afternoon. We're going to come to Lizzie Maskey, who's a bushcraft leader in Surrey. So Lizzie, are you there? Uh, we can hear you. Welcome. Cool. Hey, yeah. So I'm Lizzie and I run Pippin and Jail. We run bushcraft and foraging courses in South Wales and Surrey. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about the lime tree and domladas. Okay, so those lovely Greek wrapped vine leaves. We're going to do it with lime instead. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to make these domladas. Okay, and in the middle of them we have a load of foraged herbs too. So, and this is lime or linden tree. Okay, so it's not the lime that grows sort of lemons and limes, um, it's the tiller species. So I've got some lime leaves here, and we know they're lime leaves because they grow alternately. 
but they've got a really nice sort of heart shaped relief on them as well. Okay. Um, and what's really useful with the lime is that the very often the leaves grow at the bottom of the tree, lots of epicormic growth on the lime. Um, so it's quite easy to gather some leaves low down. So to wrap your domlada, what we've got is I've got a mix here of rice, onion that I've just fried off, and then lots of mixed herbs. So this was some wild fennel, wild marjoram, and wild mint in here. Okay, and we just want to go with a little teaspoon, and it's really easy to put in too much. And the rice isn't cooked yet, so I've just sort of fried it off like at the start of a risotto, but not added any of the water. And we're going to fold it over and then roll it closed. Okay, and then all you do from there is pop it tightly packed into sort of a oven, oven dish or a saucepan that can go in the oven and create some more as well. So, hello. Hopefully that is back on me as the camera. Um, so the plants that I've used in that were mint. So this is water mint, um, found often growing in streams or ponds. Um, ours is doing really well. Best way to check, bruise it in smell. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also got a square stem. So like the nettle and quite a lot of the other plants, it's got this square stem to it. That's another good way to tell that it is meant. Um, it does go droopy really quickly because I only picked this about half an hour ago. Um, again, it's got that same square stem to it. Um, and again, if you bruise the leaves, you get a really lovely distinct smell on that one. Okay. This is fennel. This really doesn't not droop. Um, again, can grow wild. This is actually a bronze fennel from the garden because um, we haven't got any wild near me in Surrey but this one does grow wild. Again, it's got that really distinct aniseed, dill, fennel flavour and smell to it. Um, so the advantage of herbs, you can bruise them, just check their smells and it's really good. Um, James and Lee were also talking about what they've been drinking today. Um, what I've been drinking today is cleaver water. Okay, it's got this sort of slight green tinge to it, but it doesn't look particularly strange. Tastes a little bit like cucumber water. So if you're not a fan of cucumbers, I probably wouldn't go for it. Um, but it is really nice and refreshing. And it's super simple to make. Get a jar, stuff cleavers into the jar. They stick together, which makes it even easier because you just push them together. They come out in a big lump when you're tidying the garden up or pulling them out of a hedgerow. Stick them together, give them a rinse off and then stick them in the jar. Okay, leave it for 24 hours and strain through a thin sip. All right, um, really, really nice and simple that one and really tasty. Um, the other thing that I did to go with my Dom Ladders, because you can't, you know, pretend that you're having a Greek holiday in lockdown in Surrey without some mint writer to go with it. So loads of wild mint, just rim it up, dip your Dom Ladder in and enjoy it. Sounds great, Lizzie. Wow, really, really that nice. That looks really nice. Thank you. And how can people uh, find out more about this? Because have you got this on your blog? Yeah, so um, my website's pippinandgile.co.uk. Um, so Gile, G-I-L-E. Um, it's named after the two woodlands that we started in, um, which are both in sort of mid and south Wales. Um, and all the recipes are on the blog. So the Domelada recipes on the blog. I've also got some elderflower cordial and champagne recipes on there as well. Um, and lots of other bits and pieces. Um, Sounds good. Find an elder tree. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that some elder trees smell amazing, even on a sunny day. Other elder trees smell like cat's piss. Yeah. So give your elder tree a sniff before you pick its petals. Because um, we've got two within 10 meters of each other. One is definitely going to be berries and one made awesome champagne. So yeah, so give, give them a good smell before you pick them. If they don't make you think of sunshine, don't pick them. Thanks ever so much. Thanks Lizzie, that's great. That's awesome. Thank you very much.
And speaking of Elderflower, we've got somebody waiting to speak to us now, one of our special guests, Kay Ribbenstein, who is a forest school leader uh, locally here um, in North Wales. And she's been doing something really interesting with Elderflower, something we haven't mentioned yet. So we've held it back for you. And we're going to go over to Kay now and uh, we're going to see what she's been up to. So Kay, are you there? Yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome Kay. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm great, thank you. Yeah, it was really, really good listening to you so far. Really enjoying it. So thank you for thank inviting you. me. Thank you for sharing um, this uh, special recipe with us. So would you like to uh, uh, put everybody out their misery and tell us what you've been doing with elderflowers? Yeah, sure. So there has actually been a few people in the chat room who've already attempted um, sorbet successfully. And that, that is what I have made. So elderflower sorbet is what I've been making. Um, originally, I found it in this book, which is the Hedro Handbook. Um, it's by Adele Nozadar. Noz I'm not sure if that's She's how you pronounce it. You pronounce her name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. We've got um, that book. We do recommend it. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good book. It's it's a lovely book and it's got really beautiful il illustrations in it. And all you need is you need some caster sugar, um, which is now pretty easy to find. Um ideally you need about eight elderflower um heads. As you were saying before, there's definitely a difference between picking them on a really sunny day. Um I wouldn't advise picking them on a rainy day and I, I wouldn't advise picking them in the morning. It needs to be a sunny day when the pollen's at its best and at its brightest. Um, I would actually say as well, I would pick more or bigger heads than what I've picked in that picture there um, to get the most benefit from this. Um, and then you need um, three lemons, preferably unwaxed and a litre of water and that's it. And if you've got a pan as well, <laughs> that would be useful. Um, and it's a case of making a sugar syrup. So I've made the sugar syrup, which is literally just sugar dissolved in hot water. Um, and then I've added the elderflowers into the sugar syrup along with the lemon zest. Someone's asking how much sugar. So I used 700 grams of caster sugar. So it's got quite a lot of sugar in this. There's um, a lot of sugar in uh, the, especially the elderflower cordial, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, it's very, very sweet. Um, and of course, you're diluting that one down, aren't you? So. Yeah, that's it. And you have to bear in mind as well, because it's frozen, it tastes less sweet than what you'd think. So um, someone's also saying, can they use any unrefined sugar? Um, I think that's fair enough in this situation. You know, we're struggling to find ingredients. Why not give it a go? So once that's um, cooled and it's sort of infused into the mixture, then you drain and strain out the, um, the juice from the elderflower um, into some sort of freezable container in the bottom, which is what I'm doing there. Um, and then it's, it's as simple as that, really. What you then do, if you've got an ice cream maker, you can just add it to your ice cream maker and it'll do the hard work for you. Or get back to basics. Um, so what I was doing is you just pop it in the freezer um, for two to three hours. It did take about three and a half hours for me. And every half hour, open up the freezer and stir in all the different crystals. Um, and eventually you'll get a sorbet. And uh, it is, it does taste amazing. It's really, really beautiful. Definitely worth trying. So yeah. It looks, it, great. it looks like a proper professional job there, Kay. Well done. Um, <laughs> Thank well, you. Come over once lockdown's over and try it out. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I'd definitely go for it. Nice yeah. spread of mint on top of that. Exactly. Yeah. Or lemon balm, maybe. Something like that would be yeah. good. Apparently, strawberries go really well with elderflower. Um, so I think that's going to be something that I'm going to try next. Yeah. Well, thanks, Kay. That's really good to see. Thank and, you, Kay. And we'll awesome. include um, uh, Kay's sorbet um, in the recipe ebook that we'll send out to everybody. Yes. Next, we're going to talk about and well, from one tree blossom to another, and that's the hawthorn. And the hawthorn is the other tree that you've been seeing over the last few weeks covered in blossom, although it's really quite different. Um, it's not in big umbellifer clusters like the elderflower. They are in smaller clusters and they are much bigger flowers individually. So the thing is about this time of year, we're starting to actually lose a lot of the wild greens that are in abundance in early spring. What we are getting is flowers that we can eat. Um, hawthorn is, we should, yeah, it's quite a common tree that we couldn't all identify. 
and the only one you can get it muddled up with is the black thorn but that blossoms right at the beginning of spring mm. way before this one so you should be able to tell the difference easy just by the time of year but amazingly they taste like marzipan they smell like almond but taste even stronger and to me it's it's just like marzipan so great sprinkled on a um salad you could make a jam out of it you could what else was i thinking uh, well we said salad you could i wonder if yeah like a jam would be a good one wouldn't it well Something somebody sent a... me a, a cherry blossom jam recipe on email today and i thought ah yeah i hadn't thought about jams because i'm I'm not a fan of jam, so I wouldn't have thought of that. But you could also do that with um, dog rose um, or wild rose petals as well. Use it for yeah. a jam in much the same could way. You sit down like a syrup, make a sorbet. You know that would be interesting. Oh. Maybe a bit of a wild wild blossom sorbet, elderflowers, hawthorn blossom, wild rose, dog rose in there, and uh, use that process that Kate talked about. Would be really interesting. Yeah, I don't know if I've put them all together, but. Who knows? Who knows? Well, that's it. it's, it's all about creating <laughs> yeah. and experimenting and trying, isn't it? Maybe make a couple of smaller batches and try it out, and you go, well, next year, that was the one. And one thing you always say is label what you're making and make sure you know what you put into it so you can recreate that again if you need to. Now, the hawthorn is also a tree that keeps on giving throughout the year. Um, earlier in the year, did you mention the leaves? So, it, early spring, the brand new fresh green leaves are edible quite nice in a sandwich in a salad they're a nice wild green once the flowers start coming then the leaves are no good yeah the they start to darken off don't they yeah and so it's um that first flush of leaf that you get in the hedgerows everywhere that's the hawthorn and uh, they're good to eat um you've got the blossom and then in autumn we're going to get the berries the red haws as they're called and they're good wild food as well they don't have a lot of flavour to them at all. Um, and there's a big stone that you've got to get rid of. But in terms of getting a lot of quantity quite quick, it's something you can play with, but they are very good for you. The, the whole tree, the hawthorn is the heart tree. So excellent for circulatory problems, strengthening the heart and the whole circulatory system. Uh, blood tonic um, will reduce high blood pressure, will raise low blood pressure. Um, I am not a medical herbalist, okay? I've had a few emails off people with cancer and things asking me, and I'd love to be able to advise you with my hand on my heart and say, yes, this would help. I can't. I do get a lot of my information from this book. I love it. It's one of my favourite books. So, Hedro Medicine, Julie Brutton Stitt Seal and her husband, Matthew Seal. Brilliant book. So, do could, you... Could be a brother. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a good Facebook page as well. So uh, do your own research. And because I know they do talk about if you're on warfarin, be careful with uh, hawthorn. But mm. it's, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a powerful medicine. And also on an energetic level, if you believe in this sort of thing, eating hawthorn can help you to learn to love yourself. So that's quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> so let's move to another tree. Um, and that's the ash. Um, we're not going to talk massively about Ash and the Ash Keys here. We're going to skip over it a little bit because we have a video. And there's a video we've created called uh, How to um, Eat Ash Keys. And, and that's available actually on our Patreon page, which we'll talk about. But the Ash Keys is a food that's in abundance at the minute. The ash tree is a very common tree. I've got one of the leaves here that I'm going to show for you all. Live special guest in the studio, this ash. And this is the ash leaf that you'll see about the place. It's a leaf made up of smaller leaflets, and uh, that's really um, the way to spot it at the minute. It has smooth gray bark as well um, when it's in its middling, kind of young to middling age. And what you'll notice mostly is the big bunches of ash keys. And these are the seeds of the tree. Later on in the year, they're gonna get kind of brown and papery and no good. But right now, they're in big green, dense bunches on the tree, and look out for those leaves that we showed you there. Yes, someone's mentioned ash dieback. That is a disease that's attacking ash trees, which is really sad. We don't know what the um, conclusion is going to be of that. There's a lot of ash tree suffering. It might be as bad as Dutch elm disease um, in the 70s. Only time will tell. It doesn't affect humans. But it doesn't affect the, uh, the food, uh, the ash keys to use. You're not going to um, contract any disease from using that. So do pick the ash keys. But I wouldn't pick from a 
ash dieback tree anyway. There are plenty yeah. without it. Well, it depends, doesn't it? Because the way the ash tree works is that with the dieback, it dies back from the edge. So you can have very healthy parts of the tree yeah. and parts which are just dying back at the edge. So certainly I've not heard of anybody suffering from putting keys with ash dieback. But I said, we have a video, and in the video, Lee is experimenting with ash keys because it's something that we've never eaten, eaten before. I've eaten some raw uh, this spring. They're pretty bitter, um, not the best wild food in the world, but you can gather a lot of them quickly. So it's one that's worth experimenting with and, and, and processing. So do you want to tell them what so you've So I decided, well, I keep hearing about these ash keys and I need to have a go at it, and that's the best thing about foraging is trying stuff out and experimenting. So... They apparently, when pickled, taste like capers. And um, so uh, in this jar, I've got apple cider vinegar. I always get organic. And I've put cinnamon, cloves, ginger and bay leaves and some raw honey. I, I tend to, if anything's pickled, I tend to put some raw honey in because I'm not a fan of pickled foods. It's too vinegary for me. So I just always bang a bit of honey in. But that's up to you. I haven't found a recipe for this anywhere online, but I do like my fermented foods. Well, your kimchi was a smash hit in this house. It's almost all gone, as we mentioned. So, mm. so can I've, you do the same with ash keys? So I've decided to ferment it. Um, now, normally, like with wild garlic, you can just add salt and massage and it, all the juices of the plant come out and you don't need to add anything other than the sea salt. With this, I made my own brine. So this is an experiment. And then I added garlic, peppercorns, black mustard seeds, and two bay leaves. It's time for another special guest. Yes. We're yes. going to go to um, uh, Dave Watson from Wooden Survival Crafts. And he's going to talk to us about what he's been doing with a plant, another plant that I'm less familiar with. So I'm going to be learning and what he's been making. So Dave, are you there? Hello. Oh, well we can hear you. Ah, brilliant. Okay. Well, oh. uh, yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, all very interesting stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, you've uh, been asked to uh, talk about a couple of different plants. Um, just uh, going back to some of the, uh, the uh, enticing things that we've heard this evening. Uh, I'm just uh, had a little bit of a giggle when uh, James pointed out that uh, the elder leaves are a good insect repellent. Uh, they are, um, but uh, you've got to sort of rub them very much into your skin, which makes you go a little bit green. Uh, and uh, thankfully, I've not gone angry before now when I've done that. Um, but I have noticed it's uh, quite a nasty smell, so it's quite a good people repellent as well. Um, so <laughs> anyway, back to uh, what uh, I've been asked to speak about. Uh, it's uh, one of the uh, spring, early summer plants that's not so common um, but actually it's a plant that is often not common because we don't realize it's there and that is the three-cornered leek quite an easy way to identify it funnily enough alium triquetrum um, probably not how you pronounce it um, but uh, it looks uh, not unlike uh, bluebells except for your white, white bluebells and so easily bypassed um, but what's distinctive about it is the stem, which is extremely triangular. And uh, if you look uh, at the, the top, uh, the, the whole section there, very triangular. So top tip for identifying this, if you're seeing uh, what look like white bluebells, have a look and just put your fingers on the stem but it, it is so easily mistaken for white bluebells. And added to that, it does grow in ancient woodlands. It does like a bit of damp, typically. Um, if at all in doubt, if you've not touched anything else to give you any aromas, guess what? It's got that distinctive oniony smell. Um, and very clearly, there is no question, it is three-sided, okay? Um, Top tip with, with all these things, I mean, you're not going to see lots of it. So it's one of those where I treat as a plant to say I've had, as opposed to something I'm going to harvest and use lots of, for the very reasons that uh, James and Lee have pointed out. You know, if we all uh, scrabble around getting what we can, then it's not going to be there for tomorrow. 
which is totally against the whole ethos of, of, of bushcraft. Um, and um, so, but a top tip with a lot of these plants is like theoretically you can cook with them, but if you want to get the flavors out of these uh, springtime, early summer greens, very often uh, best chopped up and put onto uh, foods right at the very end. And then you get that freshness and that real uh, oniony flavors. Typically with, uh, with the onion family, like the, uh, the wild garlic, uh, if you want to cook with them, then it's using the seeds or the bulbs. Uh, what we've got here, looking at that, we've got what you mentioned earlier. We've got the hawthorn flowers. Uh, we've got some uh, the, the purple, uh, the violets. We've got gorse. Um, gorse is okay. Um, if you can positively identify the broom, which is a related one, then the flowers and or the petals there, just that little bit um, less bitter aftertaste. Um, but gorse tends to be more plentiful. Um, but uh, the, the broom flowers, a little bit bigger and a little bit more pleasant. They have a sort of interesting taste. Uh, they always remind me of um, uh, raw runner beans, uh, which is not surprising. They're all part of the very large uh, legume family, the, the, the sort of pea family. Uh, so what else have we got? I think, ah, notice on that plate, we've also got some wild garlic flowers. Um, mm. And the little rings uh, are actually the uh, hogweed. That's the common hogweed stem. Um, one of those that is not a typical one that uh, I will uh, teach people without experience because you can easily mistake it for, for plants that are going to cause you at least irritation, uh, if not worse. Um, so if in doubt, uh, leave it out. But these are actually quite uh, nice tasting. Is that, is that a bed of lime leaves, Dave? Yeah, I'm looking at the leaves. Yes, there's lime. Uh, there might be some beech, um, but I think it's yeah, predominantly right. lime uh, there because beech tends to go papery very quickly. But when they're um, fresh, then, they're very, very good, aren't they? When they first come out, the beech leaves are yeah, yes, very nice. Yeah. The, the lime, there's, there's a lot of tree leaves, which uh, the books will tell you that are edible. And yeah, they are. But, um, so you think, mm, why would I want to bother with that? However, the lime uh, leaves stay really quite good. You'll get them even now. And although some of them are starting to get less than good, they're not so papery. And uh, there's still plenty of nice ones where you think, yes, I will have this in a sandwich as part of a salad. Mm. It's, 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 it's not second rate at all. It is first rate stuff. And you've got a stir fry, which we'll just quickly show everybody. Yeah, yeah um, I'll let you in a little secret here in that stir fries, um, certainly on wild food days, um, it doesn't take much to uh, go down really well. Now, I have got a nice mixture here. So, I mean, with a base of just chopped potato and onion, um, the rest I tend to then forage. Now, what we've got here, uh, we have got uh, mostly that the green uh, is the hairy bittercress. A lovely plant, very common. Uh, and I don't know why it's called bittercress, really, because I don't detect anything bitter about it. Uh, it's a lovely, cressy, fresh taste. Um, it is hairier than some other species that are similar. Uh, hence, it gets uh, called uh, hairy. But again, I, don't, I haven't cooked with this. I've sprinkled it on afterwards. Mm. Um, and I've also got, I think, uh, I've noticed in this one, uh, some St. George's mushroom, which grows this time of year. Uh, I think there's a bit of uh, ear fungus. What I have noticed on the bottom, near the bottom right, is mm. like a long shoot. Yeah. Um, and uh, that looks to me like that's actually uh, a, a reed mace. Um, and uh, is that the, is that the tuber, the bottom of the reed mace, is it? Yes, yes. So mm. you get these long rhizomes, and at the end of them, in the spring, you get this shoot, and it is absolutely brilliant, absolutely delicious. 
Uh, you do need to make sure you've not got any pond water in it uh, and bits in, but usually a quick, um, it's very dense, so normally a quick wash and maybe take the outer layer off, and that is top quality. Um, what I did think of earlier, actually, James, just for this time of year, particularly with any wild foods that you're picking, just remember we've now had a long dry spell, mm. lots of dusty stuff, more likely to want to rinse. Obviously, if it's just coming out, just bursting into flower, mm. but if it's a leaf, it's probably been there for a while, and this long dusty period, just be, a met, just be aware of it. As James said, common sense prevails mostly. You don't have to read a book to think about a lot of it. Thanks, okay. Dave. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much. And Hope uh, that was interesting yeah, to you. Great to have um, you. And you have you just said, you know, mentioned briefly that uh, you know I run a lot of courses. I, I've trained a lot of a lot of fine folks over the years, James, haven't I? Um, we have never <laughs> met before. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, uh, James is bushcraft tutor. Uh, and uh, yeah, I do uh, various specialist courses. I've got a lime bark course coming up in June, how to make uh, these fine containers, all sorts, but I won't spend any more time. Woodland Survival Crafts, uh, I don't want to detract from your wonderful work that you folks are doing. Well, okay, we'll send everybody a link to the two yeah. Woodland Survival Crafts. Highly recommended if you're in the Midlands or further afield. Go travel when we, when we all can and enjoy the courses there. Yeah, we've learned a lot of our foraging skills off Dave. James is trained to be a bushcraft instructor through Dave's mentoring scheme. Highly recommend. And we have a Patreon page, if anyone has ever heard of that. And it's a really good way that you can uh, find out more about wild food and foraging and continue your foraging journey. These webinars, we have huge amounts of people watching. Whereas once a month with our patrons, with our higher tier, um, they get to have a live Q&A with us. So there's a lot of talk of foraging, but also nature connection. Um, tree, James's is, is passion is trees. So lots of questions about forests and things. As you can see, you can join for as little as three pounds and go up to 10 pounds per month. But it's about becoming part of a tribe where we're all learning together and you can get exclusive videos and you are supporting our YouTube channel so we can make more and more of them. And there's videos as well. So all the plants mentioned in this video, in this uh, webinar, have actually been filmed out in the hedge, in the meadow, in the woods for a special video. And that's on Patreon now for you to watch. We'll go through all these plants and some more that we're not talking about here. There's at least 10. And you can see us harvesting them, how they grow, how to identify them. And that's all good stuff. We also have some other videos like how to eat the ash keys. And we have this one, the hunt for the pig nut. And we're going to talk about pig nuts in a minute. But on the video, we show you how to spot it, how to harvest it, and how to get this nut, which is my new favorite wild food. It's really, really good stuff. So that's patreon.com slash woodland classroom. We'd love you to join the tribe and you can get loads of good content on that. We'll send you some links via email. And we really appreciate your support and build a community together around wild food, nature connection, bushcraft. We're getting all kinds of interest and lots of people joining, which is fantastic. The last okay. thing I want to tell you about is the Complete Tree ID course, which is something that I'm launching at the minute. I've been filming it for two years and lockdown has actually given me a chance to actually put it together. I'm really passionate about trees and I've gone to all the UK trees in Britain, all the kind of 50 odd species and some of the non-natives we've had film them all in all four seasons and I've made a course online with videos you can learn how to identify them and the good news is there's a totally free taster course called kickstart your tree id skills where you can learn to identify the ash tree actually that's one of them that's included that we've and talked about paid course isn't quite ready but very soon very, very soon. soon it'll be very ready soon. <laughs> very soon it depends how soon the baby drops um we'll see it is imminent I think we're ready um, to uh, take a quick virtual trip to the coast, to the Isle of Man, where we're going to speak with Pippa, who's our special guest tonight. And uh, she runs a restaurant called Versa on the south coast of the Isle of Man, where she gets ingredients from the most local areas possible and uses a lot of wild ingredients, and especially coastal ingredients like uh, shellfish and seafood. So being in landlocked Wrexham, we don't have a coast and uh, I don't know much about coastal foraging. So I'm looking forward to learning as well. So uh, let's get Pippa on the line. Um, if Pippa raises her hand, we should be able to find her and uh, let her in. Great, well, hi, um, I'm Pippa. Uh, I'm a chef, clearly. 
Um, I I moved to the Isle of Man a couple of years ago, and I've basically just decided that it's home um, because of the foraging opportunities, I guess. Um, I've worked here, there, and everywhere, um, Michelin restaurants to little cafes because I like the food. Within a week of being on the Isle of Man for my partner's job, I just completely fell in love and decided this is where I want to be and I'm just staying here. It's a forager's dream. It's it's insane. Um, I'm not an expert forager. Uh, I know, I like to say I know quite a bit about foraging for flavour and like culinary uses and stuff in the kitchen. Oh, well, Pippa, uh, the good no, news is you haven't actually poisoned anyone in your restaurant. So no. um, <laughs> you must know what you're doing. So uh, that's fine. That's the good stuff. So I'm basically well, you've got just, some recipes uh, for tonight, haven't you, to play with and some plants to show us? Yes, um, I'm just going to talk to you about three plants that are very much in season right now um, along the coast. The thing about the Isle of Man is that actually coastal on the Isle of Man may be a bit different to coastal somewhere else. It's just such a blur between, and that's why I love it, it's such a blur between the lands and the forest and then the coast. Like you just come through a forest and bang, you're on the beach and you didn't even know it. But I'm going to start by telling you a little about this plant. So, sorry, I picked these yesterday, so they're, they're a little bit wilted, but you can still clearly see what they are. Here you go, here's my one. Um, so this is called rock samphire. So it's not related to marsh samphire, the salty one with the stringy bit in the middle that always sticks in your teeth. I don't use that one. Um, this is uh, rock samphire, and for me, this is like my sea fennel. So it's super fennelly and an easy flavoured, um, maybe a hint of licorice. It's obviously a little bit salty as well because it's a coastal plant. Um, so this will probably grow like a metre high maximum, so uh, about a foot high to be precise. Um, and it grows in massive clumps, uh, not withered. It spikes up really succulently and perky like this. Um, it grows in rocky areas, coastal, but on the Isle of Man, just anywhere and everywhere, it finds a place. Um, and the flowers come around June, and it's the umbilical termy flower that you said before. And they're these gigantic, just masses of yellow. It almost looks like the top of an Alexander head, so like wild parsley head. Um, so in terms of what you can actually do with it, Christ, you can do a lot. Um, so. The ideal way, I mean, medieval terms, they used to just like brine it and sell it around the streets of London for a ludicrous amount of money because it was so rare. Um, but so a basic pickle, like a three to one ratio, uh, literally just of water, vinegar, salt and sugar mix, that would be adequate. You don't need to add any flavorings or anything like it just speaks for itself. The best way is raw because it just, for me, it just speaks for itself. It, it, it doesn't need to... Why do something with it when it's here ready now? If you want to preserve it, that's a different story. And um, it makes a really nice salt and a really nice sugar. So if you, for example, just took this, whacked it in the blender with just salt or sugar, then spread the sheet of lovely green zinginess out, maybe dehydrate it if you want to add an extra layer, uh, but, or just leave it for a longer time on your side, and then re-blitz it again once it's dried and just stick it in a jar, this is such a nice seasoning for seafood. Um, on the Isle of Man in particular, we have queenies. Uh, it's all the rage here. They are queen scallops, so the little tiny ones. This, I mean, not many people would probably do that here, but, but I would highly recommend it, uh, use this. Um, so salts, sugars, pickle it. Obviously you can just saute it in a, a nice bit of local butter. In a salad, pickled, fermented even. Uh, Aha, you have my mandrake, if anyone's a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> this is a, this is um, sea radish, uh, is what I would call it, as a chef. I don't know the technical scientific name, but if you just Google sea radish, it will come up. <laughs> the same thing as everything else. Um, so it's a member of the cabbage family. Uh, looks a little bit like white mustard and black mustard and wild cabbage and all brassicary things like that. It's obviously got the same characteristics. This is a little bit wilted, as I said, but you can tell by the way the flower structure is. Um, I 
pretty much use every part of the plant in the restaurant. So right now it has the bright yellow flowers, which is, ugh, they're just beautiful. There's fields and fields and fields of them on the Isle of Man. Uh, they like to grow in like pebbly, pebbly ground, wastelandy style ground. They get little seed pods that look like peas. So I would obviously use those in a restaurant too. So maybe just saute them or to be honest, just eat them raw, they are divine. Um, but my favorite thing is definitely the root. So the root for me is my horseradish uh, replacement when that's not available. <laughs> so the root for me, um, I would literally just give it a little bit of a peel. I use this one here. Take the edge off, uh, just like any root that you would do. And then for me, it would always be used grated, just fresh. So obviously local meat, red meat, lamb, obviously beef, uh, eat seafood, anything like that. Um, infuse it into cream for sauces. I'd slice it up finally on a mandolin and pickle that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, can't, I could go on and on, but <laughs> sea radish. Sea, sea radish. Sea radish is definitely, definitely on the agenda quite a lot in the restaurant. That sounds good. And did you have uh, something you were going to uh, throw together tonight for us? Yeah, I do. I'll just move my stuff away. So this is just a little board of bits and bobs. So it, ha it includes the radish and the rock samphire and also some sea beets. Can you see the plate? Yes. Great. So this, the principal in Versa, Versa being a relationship as in vice versa, the relationships with the land. Um, I like to take a local ingredient, so in this case, the beetroots here, and then basically dress it up with forage stuff. So there'll always be a base, so like a seafood or a, a vegetable or something like that, but then it just gets dressed up with what's available around the land at that time. So I've literally just got some salt baked local beetroots there. They've just been put in like a salt crust and baked. Take the crust off and then I've sliced it off and basically just got an apple corer and stamped out some discs to make it look Michelin-y. <laughs> um, so then, so this is basically just a celebration of one patch of land that I walked. Um, so all of this is from the same patch of land, basically. I like to base dishes around what is literally in a square meter. If I can, especially where mushrooms regrow back, <laughs> that's insane. Um, but no, this is literally just from one little coastal footpath. So I've just got some of the rock samphire. These are just sea beets, so wild spinach, sea spinach, salty, succulent plant. I've literally just got the leaf. This is the leaf. Took a little circle, stamped it out. Now it looks pretty. <laughs> So I have some little sea beets there. So these are like a nice salty element to the dish with the fennel. It goes really well with the beetroots. You might be thinking, oh gosh, why is she using tweezers? But for me, it's so I don't bruise them and get them greasy and stuff like that. So it's barely any cooking, but at least respect the ingredients to the best they can be. Sounds like a good principle. And I'm gonna season the beetroots with a little bit of dulse. So in this pot here, if you can see, that is basically a dulse seaweed. So it's probably like the fourth seaweed out of the tide line. Uh, it's purpley, I'm told, I'm colorblind. Um, and I basically just dehydrate it, whack it in the blender and use that as a lovely kind of umami seasoning, as opposed to using anything that's not natural in the restaurant, mm -hmm. along with nasturtium as pepper and sea beets for salt. So that's that. Um, here you have your favourite, so we have the spruce shoots, Good. so as you can imagine they are literally everywhere on the Isle of Man. So no arty farty prancing around with this, literally get your spruce shoot, pick off a few needles, at the end of the day, it's all going in your mouth, a couple of those on there. So that'll bring a nice acidity to the dish and a nice lemoniness. Then I have this, if you can see. So looks a little bit like the rock sunflower, it's clearly wild fennel. So imagine we're walking down a footpath, finding all this stuff, and then you find wild fennel. Like, I, can, I never will leave the island man. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take a few bits of this to add some garnish around. 
And then what I have here is something really special. So there is goats on the Isle of Man. So this is basically goat milk. Mm. And it's so fresh. I just picked it up from a place called Kirk My Michael. Um, yeah, it, it's just delicious. So um, basically, I'm going to mix that with a bit of herb oil. So this is dill oil. The, the dill I've grown in the garden, so I didn't forage it. But just a quick note on herb oils. It's something really cool that you can do with like any green foraged herb. All the Michelin restaurants I've worked in, basically, they really beat around the bush. They make you put it in a centrifuge. Like, you have to blanch the herbs. There's so many different, like, precision and things and ways to do it. But no, excuse the language. It is absolute All you need to do is blend the herbs in a blender with a little bit of warm oil, something neutral like uh, sunflower or rapeseed. Um, blitz it up and passed it through a sieve with a, like a J cloth on it to make it a bit more fine. And it's as simple as that. that. That's all there is to it. So something I really like to do with sauces is not cook them, just use completely raw natural ingredients. So this, obviously, I've got my bit of dill oil here. I'm using dill to accompany the rock samphire. Dill and rock samphire is delightful. Adding literally just a little bit of milk. Cream works better, but I just really wanted to use the goat because it's delicious. Give it a little swirl, maybe a little bit more in there. Half and half. And then as you pour it on to the plate, This I find myself leaning in because I'm trying to get closer to the food, <laughs> yes. but uh, no matter what I do, I'm not getting any closer to it. And it creates this lovely little marbly effect, which for me just, it literally looks like the shore. You know, when you get that sea foam, when the, when the waves are hitting in and it foams up. Mm. And then, ugh, yeah, I, I love that trick. It's so simple as well, but it makes your food look fancy. You can do it at home. <laughs> and then the second from last thing I'm gonna do is obviously take my sea radish. So that's my, bitter element to the dish which so far is quite sweet with the beetroot and that kind of stuff. Just going to take a fine grater like a parmesan thing, something like that, that'll do. Give it a little grate on top. And then just to finish off, I've got an oxide daisy which I found just walking home. Going to take the petals off that. Stick a few on just for contrast. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't pick flowers just for the sake of it. <laughs> Unless you have a restaurant and you need the garnish. We are done. So this maybe would be an example of just like a little starter or appetizer or something that we do in the restaurant, basically. I have no finesse with my <laughs> the way I arrange food together. So that was a brilliant demonstration, actually. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Pippa. So the restaurant yeah, called Versa on the Isle of Man. Um, Pippa's done her bit for the Isle of Man Tourist Board. So well done. I'm sure we'll all be heading over there. So fantastic. Thanks for all your input and um, stick around for the rest of the show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Pippa. I think it's about time we talked about pig nuts and got back to uh, the main show. Should we do that? This is my new favourite. It's a really good plant. One of the best wild foods. It's a little umbellifer again. You can see the flower head there, but it's small. It only grows kind of 30, 40 centimeters high. It's not gonna get any really higher than that. And it sits at kind of meadow level. And we'll show you some pictures of that. And what you're looking for is this little nut. And it's a really good one. It's, um, it's not actually a nut, it's actually a root tuber, but it's called a big nut because it certainly tastes like one because the nut is not directly below the plant. It's slightly to the side. And I'll show you the plant, if you can see the little screen of us on the side there. If I put this up really close, you can see how the bottom of the plant, plant uh, bends to the uh, side. And the bottom of the plant is a white uh, root as well. At the bottom of that, you're looking for the nut. And so what you want to do is dig out around it and not dig right to the base of the plant, because you don't want to miss out on getting that nut. It's a really good food and it tastes nutty, buttery, peppery you can see it here there's the size of the nut 
sometimes they're kind of the size of a pea up to a large hazelnut. Sometimes it's kind of round, sometimes a little bit knobbly, but it's a beautiful wild food. But there's something we need to think about when we're harvesting a wild food like the pig nut, and that's we're actually uprooting it. And for things like the wild garlic, unless we're harvesting the bulbs, we're usually just taking the leaves or the flowers. But with the pig nut, we're actually killing the plant. And somebody mentioned in the chat room earlier, what about picking wildflowers and the effect on pollinators? And we need to think about being sustainable. And so we have a general rule that I use, um, which is the rule of fives. And I say, if there's five of one plant, I can take one of them. Um, so what I say is you have one for pollination for all our insects, one to be eaten by wildlife because they love wild food too, and they should be able to have it. Of course, wild boar love pig nuts, which is where it gets its name from. One to be trampled. There's always going to be one that gets squashed, destroyed, maybe driven over or something thrown on. One to thrive, just to be in nature. So there's always a plant for other people to enjoy. And the fifth one is one for the pot. So that's the rule that I use, the rule of fives. In the meadow where we pick pig nuts, as you'll see in the video, there's a lot of them. There's a good 150 or so. Um, so I can certainly take two or three and enjoy those. But uh, yeah, it's a beautiful uh, wild food, really, really like it, it. It's a member of the carrot family. As you can see, it looks a little bit like cow parsley, but it behaves very differently. Bush no, they grow apart. They grow scattered across scattered the meadow, not in a big across. bunch. Yeah. That's true. And of course, when you dig up the nut, make sure you put any grass back. So we're minimizing our impact on the, uh, on the ground. That's can really I just important. say as well, I've just, I've made a note here that it's apparently an aphrodisiac. Well, send your comments on that if you've had some experience. Uh, there we go. Um, I think it's about time we uh, moved on and went to a special guest. We've got Chris, um, who is really getting into his foraging and wild food. He's one of our patrons. And we've invited him to talk tonight about what he's been doing. He's been doing some special stuff with nettle. How are you doing? Are you okay? Very well, thank you. Very well. Great, great. Uh, would you like to tell the good people the amazing things you've been doing with nettle? Right, excellent. Um, so like many of you, I kind of rank myself about a two on the scale of foraging, still very much on that journey. So um, I thought I'd start like most people do with the stinging nettle. It's everywhere. It's really easy to identify. Um, and for me, the first uh, recipe that I played around with was actually um, what I called the, the hunter gatherer burger which was, um, I love beef burgers, I love to barbecue. Um, so I, I picked some nettles um, and some Jack by the Hedge, which uh, is covered in another one of their videos. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'll just try um, putting it together in, in a burger and see what happens. And actually it was really, really tasty um, because, because it doesn't blend. You get like these little pockets of, of flavor um, within within the burger so you've got the sweetness of the onion um, and the meat and then have these sort of pockets of, of uh, nettle which you give you like a really strong um, sort of punchy taste to it um, so it really got me excited about um, experimenting with with these flavors and I think um, sometimes we can be hell-bent on learning every single plant and every single herb straight off but actually I thought well I know um, these three or four plants I'm going to actually have a an experiment with them um, so yeah it, it was just a case of mixing in a couple of handfuls of uh, tips from Jack by the Hedge um, about a cereal bowl full of nettles so again you don't need great big carrier bags full um, wilting them off mixing them in with uh, with the mints uh, molding them and then um, sort of getting them on the grill and they were really really successful um, even my wife uh, and my son absolutely loved them and, and uh, we had them again uh, last night I see yeah uh, because he, he, he wanted them again. I guess it um, demonstrates how you can use things like nettle, jack by the hedge, wild garlic to just add into dishes you're already mm. doing and just have a bit of a play and experiment as long as you know they're safe and edible you can uh, start to get really creative with it Absolutely. You've been doing something else as well. Do you want to tell people what you did next with nettle? You've gone a little bit more adventurous. Yeah, yeah. so um, I like brewing as well. Um, so I'm a, um, uh, again, a, a sort of keen amateur uh, brewer. Uh, so I thought I'd have a go at making some nettle beer. Now there are tons and tons and tons uh, of 
uh, recipes out there on the internet, um, ranging from loads of ingredients to literally just nettles and sugar. Um, I, I made one that's a bit more uh, contemporary, so it uses orange juice, it uses um, nettles, um, ginger, um, and I, I tend to use um, a mixture of honey and um, sugar rather than just sugar, and gives it a little bit more, um, a bit more of a flavour to it. Now it's a bit early to tell whether this is going to come out right. I've got it's got. I've just bottled this yesterday, so um, we've got uh, probably about a week and a half to two weeks uh, of standing before that's ready to try. Um, one of the things with that is a lot of people comment, if you go on the internet, a lot of people say, oh, um, nettle beer, it stinks horrible, um, which it does. It's got a very sort of um, sort of hempy kind of smell to it, a very herbal smell, um, <laughs> shall we say. Um, but a lot of that is in the sediment um, and, in, and in the froth. So if you allow it um, um, a little bit of a stand time, not too much, most of that and if you are careful to not get the sediment in your bottles that that should be reduced uh, um as much as possible you should get those sort of real sort of citrus kicks through um with with a sort of herbal um aftertaste to it hopefully some I'll let, uh, I'll about, um chris some people are asking about the nettles is it still good to harvest it so the nettles will start to go to seed if they go to yep. seed the energy is going from the leaves into the seeds but if you cut the tops of the nettles and harvest those tops, it will regrow at the top in the next month or so, and you can harvest them again and extend your nettle season throughout the kind of summer, so you can keep harvesting them. When the nettle yeah. seeds actually go um, ripe and brown, you can harvest them, and they're a superfood mm. as well, aren't they? At the they? minute they're flowering, so get, only get the, the nettles that are not yet flowering. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, Chris. Uh, Thanks very much. Really interesting. Uh, nice old Celtic recipe there, the nettle beer. Um, yeah, looking forward to maybe trying some of that sometime. Let us know how it goes. We're going to go to uh, James Dunlop down in Essex from Wild Time Outdoors. And he's been doing something interesting with ground ivy, which is not a plant I've actually used yet. So I'm going to be learning as well. So James, you raise your hand and we'll unmute you. And I've got some pictures to share as well. And uh, we can see what you've been up to. Hello, James. Hi, hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I just jump straight in. It, the floor yeah. is yours, James. Wicked. So I've been playing with ground ivy, um, uh, glycoheteraceae, if I can get my words out. Um, and it's, I think it's a bit of an under, underrated plant. So I thought, why not use it? It smells, a lot of people, that I, when I show it to them, it's quite a pungent smell. But I really enjoy the smell. It's quite herby kind of smell. Um, it's one of my favourite wild plants. I think it was one of the very first that I ever learned, and it's it's quite easy to learn. So it's um, it, it, that's probably why it was one of my first ones because I'm not the smartest crayon in the box. Um, so yeah, so I've been mucking around with this in lots of different ways. I love making a tea, and it's very good for teas. Um, uh, it's a very old herbal remedy. One of its other names is ale hoof, and that is because back in the day, um, before hops were used in uh, to um, flavour ale, it, uh, this plant was used to flavour ale. So interesting. That's, um, that's where that name comes from. So it's fairly easy to identify. Um, so the ale hoof, the hoof referring to the fact that, of course, it's almost a hoof-shaped leaf. Um, in other books, I've seen it referenced as kidney-shaped leaves. Um, yeah, it, they're quite. I think they're actually very similar to hedge garlic or, or jack by the hedge, very similar kind of shaped leaves, but really easy to identify in the fact that it grows like ivy, but along the ground, hence the ground ivy part. Um, Particularly like shady areas then, James, do you yeah. just find it on the edge? I, yeah, tend to have to, especially in our patch of woodland over in Essex, we, I tend to have to kind of pull all the top, layer of grass and nettles to one side to get to them. They like being down low um, and hidden away. But once you grab a little bit and you pull, it just keeps coming and coming and coming. These long, long ropes of, of ground ivy. So the recipe that I made this afternoon um, was uh, ground ivy tempura, which is, 
not one that I've ever done before, but I, I normally use ground ivy in teas and salads. It, um, but I thought I'd do something a bit out there and a bit interesting. So what you're seeing there in front is the main ingredients, which are some plain flour, um, an egg and 300, I use 300 milliliters of cold water. And then of course is the ground ivy there um, next to my lovely foraging basket. <laughs> Something that uh, I was told the other day about foraging baskets, the reason we forage with baskets is because they're very good as sieves as well. So you can just wash the plants in the basket, nice. which I'd never really done before. And now when it was just pointed out to me, I was like, oh yeah, that's actually like, uh, no, of course. So anyway, um, yeah, so I made a batter up with those ingredients. And then it's just a case of heating some um, oil in a frying pan and dipping the, um, the leaves into the batter and then just dipping them straight into the oil. The oil has to be quite hot, obviously. You're basically deep frying them is what you're doing. Mm. Um, they do not look like the most pleasant of food in the world. There are better things to deep fry. Um, but I put them on the plate and they don't look too bad. I was pretty pleased with how they came out. And um, my family came inside and were asking, well, what have you been doing? What's the, the, what's the mess? Oh, it smells like pancakes. And before I had a chance to put all the washing in the dishwasher, they were almost all gone. So, yeah, that, that is what I had to pick from, literally right there. I had, that's all I was doing. I didn't, I didn't get a, a look in, yeah, after all my hard work. And it, it came out really, really well. It's definitely one that gets overlooked, but it's not worth overlooking. It's definitely worth making a use of. And it is on the ground pretty much all year round. It flowers in early spring and late autumn, but it's, a, it's pretty much available all year round. And are people asking, what does the actual leaf taste like itself? <sighs> what does the leaf taste like itself? Um, yeah, it's kind of kale If to, to make, hey, to okay. kind of put it to something that somebody will be able to understand. I always struggle with this because it's like when people ask me what rabbit tastes like and I sound like a real mean person saying, well, it tastes like rabbit. You sound like, well, what do you mean does it taste like chicken? No, it tastes like rabbit. <laughs> that's, that's the taste. Ground ivy tastes like ground ivy. You, you get the taste in your mouth and you're like, okay, right, fine, cool. Say again, sorry. The flowers as well? You can, um, you can but they're not, they're, they're, that's not where the, the flavour is. Oh. The, the most, the, the meat of the, the plant is in the leaves. And I don't know if you can see from that, the picture of the pile of them you had, some of them get quite big. You can get quite large flowers, uh, mm -hmm. quite large leaves, sorry. So yeah, there's not much worth in the flowers. The flowers are literally smaller than a, a pinky fingernail. They are. They'd look great in a salad though. They would look great in a salad if you were into decorating your food. But clearly from my pictures, you can tell I'm not into decorating <laughs> food. And that's okay. So we're Wild Time Outdoors, T-H-Y-M-E. Um, we are foster connection and um, the nature connection and confidence in children and families uh, through ancestral skills and outdoor skills. And we're Essex, London border. Fantastic. Thank you so yeah, much, brilliant. James. That's great. Thank that you, James. Brilliant. It's so it. common. It's a real good one for beginners. It's the dandelion. This is probably way too bitter, but it's just so you can see it. You know, the big bright yellow flowers of the dandelion. I, do you know what? On my news feed on Facebook, I keep seeing these uh, recipes people are making with the dandelion flowers. So people are making like vegan honeys or syrups, yellow cakes that they're using the, the petals for. It's an easy one people can use because they can all recognize it. Most people know the flower um, and it's everywhere. Because it's constantly coming into, into seed and flower and it's planting new plants, you can keep getting the young, fresh leaves. Those are the ones you want to eat, okay? Um, the older they get, the more bitter they get. You can help that by removing that inner spine, but after a certain age, it's gonna be bitter no matter what. So you might ask, well, what's the point? Why would we bother if it's, you know you have to go to all this hassle well it's a really really good medicine it's an excellent um nutrition nutritious food it's high in minerals especially potassium 
vitamins A, B, C and D, so good for overall health. It is a cleanser of the body. Like I spoke about at the beginning, at the beginning of the year, we want the toxins out of our bodies. It's brilliant for that. Its nickname is pee the bed, or the swear word version of that, because it's a diuretic. But who's to say that's a bad thing? It isn't. It's about the elimination system of the body and ridding the body of toxins. So it's a really good spring tonic. I would pick the young leaves, I would take my time to remove the spine, and I would blend it with other wild greens and put it in my couscous or my stir fry or my mayonnaise or whatever. Just quickly, somebody asked, yes, you can eat the flower, you can eat the root, you can eat the leaf as well. Not the stem. No, not Don't the, eat the stem. stem. You, can <laughs> eat, you can make a little whistle out of the stem, although it doesn't work for me. Good, good, good. So we're coming close to the end. We've got a few minutes left. Um, I think maybe should we talk briefly about the Herb Robert and the Herb Bennett? Yeah. Because they're two useful ones. The Herb Bennett, also known as Wood Avens. Here's Herb Robert, which most people will know. There we go, the Herb Robert, there it is, with its distinctive flowers. These are very small flowers. You can see them here on the shot here, how small they are compared to the photo there. But it's a very common plant that grows in uh, plant pots, cracks cracks and crannies, woodland edges. The stem is very often red, and there's red tinges to the leaves, which makes it quite distinguishable. The other one you could get it confused with is red campion, but that sits, stands taller. This one's a bit more low growing, but it does, it, it's, it's an opportunist of a plant and grows in cracks and crags and all sorts, but it's, um, um, the leaves are edible. Yeah, it's like kind of herby they're okay. flavour. They're fine, the, 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 the flowers can be used in a salad. It's one you're going to add in with other, you know, flavours, you know, add it in with some lettuce in a salad, some nice fresh beech leaves, maybe some sorrel and things in there, and add a bit of herb rubber in for the nutrition, really, rather than the flavour. It's not a bad flavour, it just doesn't really taste of anything. We're going to move on to the next plant, Herb Bennett. So there are two plants in here, just so, just to confuse you, the Herb Bennett is the one that's standing, oh, standing tall. Oh. I'll manipulate the plant. With the yellow, with the yellow flower. This one's looking a little bit sorry for itself, but it gives you an idea of the height. This is in the pot here, you can see the kind of height it grows at, kind of around the 40, 50 centimetres mark. And uh, we found it growing alongside Herb Robert. It's also known as Wood Avens, so you might know it as that. It's a bit more herby. I prefer the leaves on this to Herb Robert. They've got a little bit more of a herby flavour to them. But again, same kind of thing. You're going to add them to a salad with mixed, stronger flavours. But what's interesting about the Herb Bennett is the root. We dug out the root the other day, and we do this on the video uh, that's on Patreon, where we dug it out and harvested that, and it smells of cloves, and it tastes of cloves as well. And we've read that you could use it for something like chai tea or maybe use it in mulled wine like you would use cloves. That would be interesting, perhaps. It's got antibacterial and anti... Oh, the other one. Anti-inflammatory? No. It was a good guess though, wasn't it? Antiseptic. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, mouthwash and um, disease and infections of the mouth, gums and throat. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was like a clove, but... Mm. Not as strong as a clove, but it was definitely there yeah. when, I, when I bit into it and tasted it. Isn't and you could smell curry? it as well. In a curry or a chai tea, yeah. It's only a small root, though. We're only talking about, you're looking at something about that big and, you know, thinner than the thickness of my finger. So it's only a small thing. You're going to have to have a, quite a few. But you chop it up fine and sprinkle it and into it the food. It is common. It is really common. Yeah. So we're coming near to the end of the show. And what we want to just say is, uh, it's been really good. Have you enjoyed it? Me? Yeah. Yeah. And we're really looking forward to uh, reading the chat room afterwards and seeing all the comments people have made and their ideas. So thank you for sharing those. But guess what? This is just the start of your wild food year because these uh, webinars have been so successful um, that we're going to start doing these every month. So starting in July, we're having June off for the baby that's about to land. But starting in July, on the Wednesday the 15th, we're going to start a monthly webinar and workshop like this, which is your wild food year. And we're going to show you the top plants to find at that time of the year, what you can do with them. We're going to have some special guests on, all kinds. And that's going to happen every month. And you can book to go to one of those. You can book to go to 12 if you want to. There's no commitment to go every month. You can book into the ones you're interested in. And as we get into autumn, of course, we're going to get into nuts, berries, 
making all kinds of interesting stuff. Mushrooms even might cover a couple of those. So, well, thank you everybody for watching and for joining us. If you have any specific wild food questions, you can ask us. Um, you can join YouTube our Patreon channel. page yeah, where you can get um, lots of resources there. Woodlandclassroom.com is the website. Look for the fox. Look for the fox and you'll find us, Woodland Classroom. <laughs> it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you everybody for watching. Stay safe. Happy foraging. Send us what you've been doing. If you have a recipe, send it to us. We'll put it in the ebook. And uh, take care of yourselves. And uh, hopefully we'll all get to enjoy a bit more nature as these weeks go on. Yeah, thank you thank very much you. for coming, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.